Welcome to the My Haunt Life Podcast. Hello, thank you for tuning in. It's Mike and Russell again with the My Haunt Life Podcast. It's a new year. It's 2016. It's January. And last year was awesome. Our last two episodes focused on haunt season and everything that we did during October and a little bit in September, a little bit in November. But overall for 2016, there was a lot that we've done that never got mentioned because we didn't have a podcast. So this is a new segment and we'll probably do this once a year. So Russell, what are your top three moments of 2016? Wow. Way to put a guy on the spot. <laughs> it's what I do best. Um, so, uh, yeah, you, you kind of surprised me. Uh, uh, you walked in and immediately asked me that question, and now you're launching into it. 2016 was a, a year of ups and downs, certainly, when it comes to haunt and adventures and, and uh, things like that. If I had to choose a top three, one of the things is I was able to return to Fantastic Fest, and we actually did a podcast where I basically, as fast as possible speaking as fast as possible, went through the movies that I saw there. Fantastic Fest was a chance to reconnect with a, a filmmaker that uh, I really like, and we've known each other for several years, named Jimmy Weber. He directed a film called Eat, which is a psychological horror film that is out there for your viewing pleasure, if you look for it. And a chance to connect with some people I hadn't seen in a while, and saw some really amazing genre stuff. Uh, I've been lucky enough to see things which are coming out in 2016. And if you go back and listen to the Fantastic Fest podcast, I go into more detail. But there's films coming like February and Devil's Candy and The Witch, which are all going to be out there and available to you in 2016. And going to Fantastic Fest last fall, reconnecting with old friends, seeing a whole bunch of really new, exciting material, some foreign stuff, uh, lots of new releases. It was just a highlight, and it came at a time when I had been working a really tough job. So just to immerse yourself in horror and sci-fi and action films from around the world, which is what Fantastic Fest does so well, that was definitely one of the highlights. And if you want more information on this year, go to FantasticFest.com. And you can hear more about Russell's review of Fantastic Fest in episode three of our podcast. Thanks, Mike. Another one of my top three has to be working with Evil Twin Studios for my third year in a row. We create a haunt in South Pasadena during the Halloween season for charity. And this year we created something called Ward 13, which got excellent, excellent reviews. And we had a couple moments in there that kept getting mentioned in a lot of the reviews. And it was a really proud moment for me and for the entire Evil Twin Studios team to realize that we had done something and created something that so many people were having a good time. The success was so much more than we expected. It was really exciting to be a part of that. And I, I absolutely love the Evil Twin Studios team. It's a pleasure to work with them and to create something that got so much positive attention this year. It was an honor. It was exciting. It was thrilling to be behind the scenes each night. Uh, it was It was truly one of the highlights of the year for me. And at the beginning of creating the haunts for this season, uh, the 2015 season, I got pulled into doing the promos and a lot of the production stills. And I had the chance to really create a, a, a trailer that was a lot of fun. I Several of the Evil Twin guys um, uh, and gr gals were definitely in the, in the trailer. And if you go to EvilTwinStudios.com, you can see some of this imagery in that trailer. It's still up on the internet. Mike, I, I pulled you in because I needed a struggling person at one point during the shoot, and you were willing to uh, let me restrain you to a wheelchair and struggle for me. Uh, which I sincerely appreciate. But it's just a normal Saturday for me. Oh, okay. All of that happened. And that was really exciting for me to work again on some of the promo stuff for Evil Twin Studios uh, because I am an editor by trade. And this was a lot of fun to create something so not like what I normally work on. Um, when I was working on that for Evil Twin Studios, I was also cutting a preschool children's show. So it was definitely a different flavor than what I was going to work every day. But in addition to that, creating the haunt for the 2015 haunt season and our response was so positive, that was truly a high point for the year. And for my top choice, I have to kind of allude to it because it is something which I've actually been sworn to secrecy about. But I will say this. 
working in haunts, being such a fan of haunts, every now and then you get an opportunity where somebody says, oh, I really highly recommend this show to you or I think you should check this out. Mike, I know that you and I have both had in the last uh, year, year and a half or so, some opportunities come our way where we get invited to shows first or you know, we're asked to be part of a preview night or something like that and uh, we're asked to give feedback or notes or whatever. I got to say that has happened a couple of times in 2015 and there was one in particular or two in particular uh, or three in particular now that I think about it (laughs) (laughs) Um, where I twice I got asked to perform in private haunts. I got asked to perform in a haunt that was performed for one person and one person only. This happened, uh, I think it was in mid-November. And it was really a thrill because they they came to me and said, we want to create, we want you to create this villain and we want you to fill this particular part of this haunt for this individual. And like I said, I'm kind of sworn to secrecy as to what it was done for. Uh, and it was a complete labor of love. And it was these people coming together to do something for a friend that was, that was just awesome. And, but more, more than that, I got... To participate in sort of a haunt challenge, I guess would be the way to put it. And it was truly one of the most exciting things that I did last year. Basically, I got a very, very strange email. I did some research on the name that the email was in and found out that it it actually correlated with some news reports from several years ago that involved a serial killer. I started to get a couple of follow-up emails, which led me to being invited to an event. And that event turned out to be a very private, very small, but very intense haunt. It's something which might grow. It's something which might uh, expand and be open to other people in this coming year. I hope it is. Uh, But the idea of just this really intense little mini haunt performed just for me and a couple of other people that night, that was an incredible experience. And again, I think it comes from the fact that there was so much passion and love behind it. And it completely freaked me out because I didn't know going in exactly who was staging the event. It had kind of gotten a stamp of approval from someone that I knew. And they said, oh, I kind of know what's going on. You'll be fine. But I will say that it was one of the most thrilling things I did because going in not knowing was extremely intense because I was giving myself over and trusting someone who I literally didn't know what the rules were and didn't know uh, what exactly was going to happen. And it turned out to be goofy and fun and exciting and scary and all the things that you would expect from a good haunt or escape room. Uh, It was that type of an event. And that was truly one of the highlights of, of my year. Um, and I think it, it comes from the fact that I also, um, uh, we covered it in an earlier podcast that you for your birthday got kind of a private room treat. And I was part of creating that. And I think that also feeds into this exact same kind of emotion. And the fact that it's just a labor of love and very passionate between you know, a small group of people. And you don't have to deal with all of the haunt rigmarole uh, and the jumping through hoops that some small events have to do. It just become, it becomes something among friends. But like I said, I got invited to this private event. I hope it expands. I hope it goes into a bigger market. And um, it was truly, truly an exciting little thing. That's awesome. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. And I think I did it like the day or two before. And I can echo everything that he was saying. Like it's it's a one of a kind of experience. It honestly truly is. And it's something that I've never experienced before. And, you know, I hope I do eventually again, but cause it was that, it was that awesome. So I totally agree with you on that. So basically that's my top three, even though I can't really describe one of them very effectively because I'm sworn to secrecy. Uh, so Mike, what was your 2015 highlights? That's definitely a great list, but I think, mine might top it. I know this isn't a competition, but you know, I'm sure you have more adventurous stuff. I do. Uh, my top three, and this is no, in no particular order. It's just based on when they happen throughout the year. Uh, my first one is going to Germany and the Czech Republic on a ghost tour. A few years ago, I took a trip to Transylvania 
Yes, there really is Transylvania uh, on a Dracula tour that this company called Tours of Terror offers. And every year they also do what they call a ghost tour. Basically, they're all in Europe and they go all over. There's London, there's Ireland, Scotland. And this year, for the first time ever, they went to Germany and the Czech Republic. And in Germany, we went to Frankenstein's Castle. We went to the Frankfurt Cemetery. Uh, and then along the way, we went to the Sedlik Od Ossuary, which is, uh, you might know as the Church of Bones, and just went to all of these creepy places. Uh, we stayed in Prague, in right near the town square. Uh, we took a few ghost tours there. We went under the city to where it was before the war and where they built it back up. It was, it was incredible. You know, you go for the creepiness, but you get kind of awestruck based on all the history. Another thing that we went to in Germany was Nuremberg, and it was where Hitler stayed, where he built the Colosseum and where the marching grounds were. So basically, when you, whenever you see all the movies from, from the 40s of the Nazis marching and listening to Hitler speak, we went there. And I stood where Hitler stood and gave his speeches. And even though he was a horrible, terrible person, the feeling there was just incredible, like knowing that you were standing in such a historic spot that was one of the highlights of the trip it you know it's funny because the trip is supposed to be creepy it's all people into horror it's all people into ghosts and things like that but the best part of the trip was being there it's just nuts and there was a museum there and we got to see a bunch of artifacts from from germany and it it, it was just a, it it you can't i can't describe it and like i'm getting tongue-tied just talking about it because if there's like so much to say it was an amazing experience and I highly suggest it if you have the extra cash to go definitely go and they're doing two other tours to Frankenstein's Castle to Germany to Prague in 2016 one of them is in June and the other one is during Halloween and you get to spend Halloween at a party in Frankenstein's Castle which is incredible and on the Dracula tours they have a party on Halloween inside Dracula's Castle which is just, that's when I went a couple of years ago and it was just incredible uh, so you can check them out. Their websites are ghosttour.com, and that's with one T. So G-H-O-S-T-O-U-R.com. And then for the Dracula tour, it's dractours.com, D-R-A-C-T-O-U-R-S. After that, uh, and this is something Russell just mentioned a little bit of, but my birthday, my birthday escape that him and Debbie planned, and it was it was just incredible. The whole experience, that whole weekend, you know, driving up, not knowing where I was going. It was, it was just awesome. You know, having, having friends that are so close to you and know you so well to know, like, this is going to be awesome for you. We're going to do this and go out of their way to, to create and, and make this happen. Like seriously. Awesome. You know, for I, those of you who have not listened to the earlier podcast, we basically, for Mike's birthday, Debbie kind of spirited him away, and I arrived at the hotel before a ghost tour that night, and I dressed up his room as a little escape room challenge series of puzzles. Uh, so when he walked into the room, it had been ransacked and covered with blood-soaked towels, and he had to figure out a couple of clues to figure out where to proceed and go next. Yeah. And it was, it was incredible. I was not expecting that at all. I was expecting to just get out of town for a few days, relax or whatever. And I get there and first of all, I'm led into this bloody room and it's, then it turns into an escape room. And then later that night we went to a ghost town and had a ghost tour and it was, it was just awesome. The thought and everything that went into it, it was just, it just blew me away. So, you know, thank you again, Debbie. Thank you again, Russell. That was a blast. We had a good time. Yeah. Okay, enough of the feels. Um, and then rounding out my top three was my trip to Colorado. Uh, I mentioned the, the Dracula tour and the tour to Germany. One of the people I met early on at that Dracula tour that when I first went was uh, Matthias. And Matthias lives in Colorado, and we, we instantly got along. He's a DJ, a vinyl DJ also, and just, just one of the best people you could ever meet. You know, you meet some people and, you know, you can just right away tell how nice and genuine they are. That's Matthias. He's amazing. I met him on the Dracula tour. Him and I shared a room on the Ger in the Germany tour because he, he also wanted to go and check it out. And he actually might be going 
to the the other ones uh, as a translator and the tour guide because he speaks German and he definitely helped us out a few times in Germany. He definitely helped me out. Thankfully, I was his roommate because whenever we'd walk in Germany or we'd go to order food, he could order for me. I was kind of like his date, I guess. Like, <laughs> but you know, when you're when you're going overseas and you don't know the language, you, you know, of course you're going to be like, uh, can you order me this? Can you do this? What is this? And and he was able to do it and. That's One... awesome when you have that opportunity when you travel internationally. Absolutely. Because mm -hmm. I've, I've done it both ways. I've been on my own and I've done it with a friend who uh, was definitely that valuable. Yeah. And one of the things he, he definitely came through for the whole group. And I think this is what impressed the, the people that put on the tour is we went to there was a torture museum and it wasn't open. It wasn't open for another three or four hours. But Matthias sweet talked them in German, which can you imagine German sweet talk? It's kind of scary to think about, but he was able to sweet talk them and they actually gave us a private tour and the tour guide would, would sell us everything about it. Matthias would translate. And then if we had questions, we would ask them and it, that, that was incredible. Anyways, he lives in Colorado. Randomly one day I got an email from Frontier Airlines saying that they were offering $30 round trip flights out of LA. And one of those flights was to Colorado. So I hit him up and asked him if, if it would be any trouble if we could stay with him and, you know, just go because this round trip ticket was worth it to just go. I mean, that's a tank of gas to drive for a couple hours in L.A., you know. So we went to Denver, Debbie and I. And wouldn't you know it that the week before we left, there was a group on for the Stanley Hotel. Now, if you don't know what the Stanley Hotel is, that's the hotel Stephen King stayed in and based on his experiences there, wrote The Shining. So when you watch The Shining, that's basically what Stephen King went through staying at the Stanley Hotel. They had a group on for, I, I think it was something like half off the rooms. Who knows when I'd be back in Colorado to take advantage of this. And if I was back, would, the rooms would probably be full price. So we decided to go to the Stanley Hotel for two days of our trip. And it was incredible. We got to stay on the fourth floor. The fourth floor is the most haunted floor. And on top of that, we stayed in the very last room down the the in, infinity hallway. Now, if you watch The Shining and you see the you know where the twins the twin girls appear, that's the hallway that Stephen King saw them. And we stayed in the room basically right there. And we definitely had experiences. It, it was creepy. I woke up in the middle of the night. And it sounded like there was something scratching at the closet door. My heart was racing. And I, as soon as I got up, because I brought, I brought some of my ghost hunting equipment, I brought, you know, recorder and night vision camera, all that. As soon as I walk, got up to try and get it on tape, it stopped. And that was it. And that was just one of the many experiences. Another thing that was amazing about this is after we took the ghost tour, uh, we talked to the tour guide and I told him like, Hey, you know, we're, we're from LA. We have ghost hunting equipment. Is there anywhere we can go? And he basically told us that since you're guests, you can go anywhere you want. And we ran with that. We went into the music hall alone. It was just Debbie and I and got to investigate the music hall alone and being able to investigate such a high profile and haunted location by yourself was amazing and frightening at the same time and we did get some stuff um i used a spear box and we were we think we were talking to lucy she basically told us she could move the car and that when i said okay i guess we're gonna go she said okay and it was just it was just fun and awesome and just being in such a historic place it was it was incredible when i went to colorado it was the middle of november and the weekend I was there, they had a haunt going on, which was awesome. And I was so excited. And it was the 13th floor haunted house in Denver. And what they did, this was a little bit different than their usual haunt because they called this one Blackout. Now, you know, as a Blackout survivor, I was really excited. It was like, oh my God, Blackout's in Denver. But it was just the name of this haunt for the, this weekend. And the reason they called it blackout was because it's the same haunt they have during Halloween, except all the lights are out. It was a blast. I had so much fun at this. It was one of my favorite haunts this year. You go through, you get a glow stick per group, 
and you just walk through this maze and it's a literal maze with the lights out. And all the while there's good, there's people and monsters that grab you that, you know, will come up behind you without making a noise and breathe in your ear, all sorts of things like that. At one point I was taken away from my group and left in pitch blackness, trying to find my way. And I was giddy the whole time I was laughing. I was trying to like talk to monsters to take me even further away and get me lost and, and everything like that. And it was, it was just so fun. So if anyone is listening to this is in Denver or is going to be traveling to Denver for Halloween, definitely check them out. Um, I really wish I could have checked out the regular haunt during the season, but we had about eight gazillion other haunts in LA that we were going to at the time. I went to two escape rooms there as well. One was a zombie escape room and one was called the cabin. These were so much fun. They're both, both horror inspired and with, I'm not knocking them, but it seems that the creators of this came to LA for a weekend, hit the best escape rooms, and then went back to Denver and created them. You know, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, and that's what I felt these were, just imitating ones we've already done. But with that being said, they were extremely well done. They were awesome. The, the zombie one was basically uh, the same as the one in LA, trapped in a room with a zombie, where where the zombie is chained up and every X amount of minutes the chain is released and you can't be touched or you become zombie food and you can't play the game. Uh, this one is a little bit different than the one in LA because it once you got tagged, you could do silly, stupid things from the zombie master to get let back in. So, you know, if you get tagged, you could be like, okay, sing happy birthday and you can go back in, you know, things like that. It was really, really fun. It was definitely challenging just because the zombie was guarding some of the clues. The other one we did was the cabin, and this one was awesome. This one really reminded me of the basement, and the basement's been around for about a year and a half, I would say, and you, this was very, very heavily influenced by the basement, in my opinion. You were in someone's house, there was blood, and there were secrets hidden everywhere. I don't wanna give away a lot because a lot of what the basement has surprises you. Um, but I will say that those surprises were also in, in this escape room as well. We didn't escape from that or the zombie room, unfortunately, but with the cabin, we were one clue away and I feel that we did escape. They have a, they had a lifeline, like they had a, like a radio that you could get hints from. Like some of the other escape rooms we talk about, they give you hints that was not working for us. So if we had that last hint, we would have escaped. We were one step away, literally one step away. We had to we had to find the final code and that was it. And we just missed it. The radio didn't work, so we didn't escape. The zombie one was just that was just tough. We made it pretty far, but you know, we didn't do well enough. Oh well. <laughs> uh, another thing that I've done that since our last podcast and since Halloween was another heretic show. This one was called Vanish. And this one, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> That's all I can really say. Uh, I, it was, you know, when you go into these extreme situations and you come out and say they were fun, it make, really makes you think about where your psychology is. But this one, it was fun, but not in a way where you go to karaoke or a baseball game or something. Or, you know, it was fun in the way that, this is so interesting and the way that this haunt is making me feel right now hasn't been made me feel this way any other time. This story was based on a personal experience of Adrian, who's the creator of A Heretic, and one of his friends unfortunately was murdered. And the way this haunt made me feel, it made me feel that I was in her shoes. And I haven't spoken to Adrian about this, but I'm pretty sure that that's how he wanted you to feel. It, it was, it was interesting. It was, it was, you know, just, just that feeling, you know, you, you start out, you go through the haunt and it's, you know, the typical extreme haunt kind of stuff. Um, you get manhandled, you get thrown in a small room, blindfolded bag on your head, you know, all that kind of stuff. But then all of a sudden you're, we were led out into a car 
and we knew this was happening this was in in the way in, in the waiver and leading up to this where you know you're going to be in a car driving somewhere and this took place in the desert in the middle of nowhere we met in victorville and i don't even know where that car ride led us after that but basically we're in a car i had my hands behind my back duct taped and driving the driver stayed in character didn't talk to us and had the radio just blaring loud of some in-between station of Spanish and static. So as the radio, you know, as you'd hit certain spots, you'd hear, you'd hear music, but then you just hear static. And it was so effective. And after about 10 minutes of driving in the middle of nowhere in the pitch black, because these roads really didn't have streetlights, I, all I could think about was like, wow, this is, this is what it feels knowing you're about to die. Like this is the, these are the last thoughts that someone would have who's been kidnapped going in the middle of nowhere, knowing that they're going to their death. And it was so powerful. It was so effective. And it was, it, it's just insane. Like, because this happens all the time to people, you know, and it's not for fun. It's not make believe it's real. And having, even though I knew it was fake that I still had that terror your mind just wanders off and you start overthinking. And it's like, Oh my God, like no one would ever find me. No one, I don't, you know where, I don't even know where I am. Like I'm going to my, I'm going to die. Uh, this is where I'm going. I'm going to die right now. And there's nothing I can really do. It was, it was just, it was powerful, man. Like, I know I just said that, but that's all I can really say to describe it. And it was, yeah. I mean, hats off to, to heretic, uh, in this last show. Um, it was, it was awesome. Um, yeah. That sounds like a really, really awesome show. Unfortunately, um, I did not get an invite to that show. And uh, I do have one question for you because you mentioned it after Vanish was over. And I heard from someone who did Vanish later in the evening than you did. And I... It's the same criticism which we had about the previous show rituals that he had done is that there was a real flow problem. And I know for later in the night, uh, somebody told me that the weather was a problem, flow was a problem. Uh, they wound up waiting literally for 20 minutes alone in a room because I guess something had happened with the show. So I, I, I heard that there were flow problems and rituals, the last third of rituals in particular was a bit of a mess flow wise. We, we literally, you know, uh, we were not in the same group for rituals, but there was this point where literally you sat around for a very long time listening to the other members of the group going through the scene that you had already done. And it happened about three times in a row. And I know that you had mentioned some of Vanish didn't flow very smoothly. And I heard from someone else who said it really didn't flow smoothly. So, so how did you feel about that overall? Did it run smoothly for you? Well, with, you mentioned rituals and, and, and I agree, um, you know, and that was one of the things I had told Adrian is, you know, it's kind of, it gets boring, you know, because you get all of this buildup and your adrenaline's going and you're scared and you don't know what's going to happen next. And then you just wait. And that's kind of like a cool down period. You yeah, have to wait Yeah, the tension for... in rituals kept getting deflated over and over right. again. Right, and that. So I agree with you on that one. For vanish, I wouldn't say it was a it was a flow problem. For me, compared to rituals, it wasn't the same type of show. I mean, people did all get the same treatment for the most part, but I felt as in vanish, the terror was constant, because whereas in rituals you were all waiting and you could hear everything. You know, this is going to sound weird because it's the same exact thing because in Vanish you were, or yeah, in Vanish you were waiting and you heard everything going on as well, but at the same time, you weren't with everybody else. It wasn't a, you know, everybody is standing in this room one by, and one by one they come in, okay, there's the last person we go. I think th be, this was more effective because there was an uncertainty. I didn't know how many people were going to be coming. And at the same time, I didn't realize that we were waiting. I thought it, this was part of, I mean, obviously it was part of the show, but I thought this was intentionally part of the show. Whereas, you know, the whole point of being in an extreme haunt is, you know, to be uncomfortable. And, you know, I was thrown into a pitch black closet duct tape with my hands behind my back. And I waited and waited and waited and it 
wasn't boredom. It, I was still worried because, you know, at any moment someone could come and open a door and, you know, do something or take me. And that's what I think was different for me for Vanish as opposed to Rituals, because in Rituals, I knew there wasn't anything happening because one by one, people kept coming into the room. But when you're alone, it, it was a totally different feeling. So, you know, that's my aspect, my outlook on that. Oh, interesting. It sounds like it was an improvement over what we experienced in Rituals. Uh, I, I really wish I could have done Vanish. Yeah. Uh, I really do. I, I want to do that show and I didn't have the opportunity. Just like I got really, really sad listening to you talk about that. You know, and, and you know, with all heretic shows, it, it's really tough to get tickets. And, you know, for anybody listening that gets it, that's interested, it, you know, it, it is hard, you know, not a lot of tickets go on sale because these are so, um, so many few people go through and they're usually a one night only type of thing. So, you know, for people listening, you kind of have to be on the ball and be ready whenever tickets go on sale and. You know, that's really all we can really say about it. Yeah, I, I wish them luck in the future, and I hope they do manage to expand because I know a lot of people who are frustrated with them. Uh, did you feel the show was safe? Because that has been an issue, and it was an issue with rituals, certainly. Oh, definitely. I mean, at, at no time did I think I was in real danger. Um, you know, it's all stimulated danger. You know, like, like I, like I was saying, like, this is how it feels knowing you're about to go to your death. I didn't really think I was going to die. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, well, yeah, I mean, what I meant is like during, when we were discussing rituals, uh, in an earlier podcast, we both pointed to the pointless physical aggression. Uh, was that present in Vanish? Um, yeah, I mean, it's at this point, I expect it in heretic shows, you know, to be some sort of get manhandled and whatnot. And yeah, it happened, um, you know, but it made sense to the story, you know, like you're being kidnapped and you're being, I wouldn't say you're being tortured because it, it was not torture. Um, so don't get the wrong idea, but you know, being, being kidnapped, taken to a place, getting roughed up and then taken to your death. Like it made sense to me. No, oh, that, that I'm actually glad to hear that because that's always been one of my issues with heretic in the past, particularly with the midnight killer shows. And we talked about it in rituals a lot of that aggression seemed completely pointless and didn't make sense with the story. I'm glad to hear that it did with Vanish. Right. At least in my mind, it did. Oh, that's good. Glad to hear it. As far as haunts, uh, since Halloween, that's what I've been up to. And since then, two of our favorites have made reappearances in our lives. Uh, Blackout and Alone both both came up out of nowhere and had a had a little thing for us to do the alone puzzles were extremely challenging this time alone is known for in advance of their shows releasing uh little challenging puzzles little things that you can explore and have fun with uh this time around i felt that they were much harder much more challenging and to be totally honest, much more annoying for me because of... <laughs> You're not certain... alone. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think numerous people said that. Uh, for example, in one of the clues, actually, they had a misspelled word, apparently, which definitely threw me off. And uh, when you reach the final conclusion, you were supposed to get two words as an answer. It asks you to find the answer to a question, except because of a verb that they used it's almost as if the two words that you were supposed to come up with were incorrect. they like, they were wrong answers to the question. So I was really confused by that. And I finally had to say, wait a minute, like, am I in the right area? And we, and Mike confirmed that I did have the right answer. And then somebody else had confirmed, but it doesn't make sense with the riddle that was given. So am I crazy? Yes. Yeah, I'm crazy. <laughs> oh, I mean, oh, you're talking about alone. I'm talking about the alone puzzles. Oh, well, in general, yes, you are. But um, no, the, and the, the same thing happened to me. Uh, the last clue uh, going, what, it, it, I mean, I'm not going to say just because I think it's still going on for people. Um, but the last clue um, leads you to two words. And yeah, it, it basically seems like you're wanting the opposite of what, where you find the clue is, if that makes sense. But overall, though, how do you how do you feel about it? Did you enjoy it? Did you like it? Like what? Um, it's interesting. I, I have always felt that their riddles, their puzzles were absolutely challenging enough. So them making them more challenging and more difficult 
and then adding misspelled words and confusing verb tenses and things like that to it, this was no longer fun for me. I really wanted to solve these. And I took the time out of my days to do it and work on it and figure it out. And I didn't ask for help from people. I avoided the clues that people wanted because I had people wanting to give me help. And I was like, no, I'm trying to figure this out on my own. Th this series of, th I guess there were three of them total, I found much more difficult than in the past. And I thought they were fine in the past. So what it does for me is I no longer am looking forward to their next show. That's because a bummer. I, I, and I, I am completely bummed out by it. Because I like the artsy side that Alone goes for. I, I, I always will come back to Alone because they are always trying something new. But at this point, they've taken a lot of time, which I gave willingly. Right. So it becomes a really weird thing. And also, I think part of my frustration goes back to um, I had multiple friends who went th through the last Alone show that had jumped through the hoops, driven across town, figured out a puzzle, gone to a business, spent money at a business at Alone's encouragement. And then when they did the show, the information that was given, they were not allowed to use in the show. So they did all of this effort and there literally was no payoff whatsoever for the effort. And I am so disappointed that I feel this way. And I couldn't feel any more opposite than you do right now. And it's, it's kind of funny to me because I love their puzzles and I actually wish they would be harder, you know, because I'm, I'm that nerd guy that gets his Excel spreadsheet out, puts all the letters in there, does this, looks up, has like a list of every cipher, you know, things like that. And when you finally find the answer, it's like, yes, oh my God. Okay. I got this. Okay. What's next? You know? And the end, the end result is, is just, it's just a fun time. And it makes me feel smart <laughs> being, well, being I, able to figure this out. <laughs> I, I am so happy that you feel that way because I, I love that my friend is enjoying this, but I, you know, entered it with the same spirit that you just described where like, okay, let's have some fun with this. Let's investigate. And it just kept getting more and more frustrating for me. And then when I discovered that, okay, wait, this, this really is this confusing I, I don't know. It just, it became more than I was expecting maybe. And it kind of killed my spirit a little right, bit. Right. But you shouldn't just let a, this puzzle affect the way you feel about their, their events. Cause it's just one thing. Oh, that's a very valid point. Absolutely. And I'm trying my best not to, but like I said, you know, I went through alone's last show with a buddy of mine and you know, he didn't get a chance to use what he learned from the puzzle you know, that was a disappointment. Right. Is this frustration ever going to pay off? You know, I'm always willing to go back to it alone because I, I do find them very, very intriguing and very interesting. And I love some of the performance art references they've given in the past. You know, it speaks to my theater nerd side and some of the performance art stuff they've referenced from the East Coast in a, in a past show. I was totally turned on by and thought it was interesting. But this introduction to whatever is coming next for alone just became so much frustration for me. See, and I don't even think that this is leading to the next thing. I think this was a continuation of the past June through October, oh, July through October. That's because, quite possible, yes. Because especially with the end result, what you get, I think that shows it. You know, I, I get the frustration. I know a couple of, of my friends, and, and myself included, will get emails from strangers on Facebook basically saying, I know you figured this out, just tell me what it is. Like, no, you earned that. You know, I worked way too hard to just give my answer up. And Oh, I, I completely you know, agree with you. And I also got several of those messages over Facebook of complete strangers hitting me up going, hey, I saw you commented on a loan. You know, do you have the answer yet? And the other thing which I expressed to you, I had someone literally send me the answers <laughs> to the first one. And I, and I was so furious. Luckily I had figured it out before that person sent me the information. And I, and I wrote them back. I was like, what you just did was extremely rude and I don't appreciate it Yeah, because I like you, I worked for that and I don't want someone to take it away from me personally. So, so it's not like I'm just whining and moaning here. I did go through the process of, 
like, I really, really want to figure this out. I really want this to be fun. For some reason, this round became something different for me. Right. And that's, that's a bummer. It is, it is. But I, you know, I love the fact that other people are enjoying it. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things I want to say is, you know, despite the frustration, despite how, how many people get aggravated because it's too hard or, you know, if they can't figure it out, this, and Russell, I'm not directing this at you at all, but just, just in general, like reading their comments on Facebook, but it's like, this is something totally extra that they're doing out of their love of what they're doing. And you I know, totally like, appreciate that. I yeah. absolutely love the fact that they do this kind of stuff. And I mean, the year thing round. is, the thing is, like, and that's exactly it. Like, this is during a time when there's re- there's nothing else going on. They could easily, on November first, just pack up everything, and we don't hear that from them again until either Scare LA or you know October first or you know whatever during haunt season. But it's like they're going out of their way. Like they've done something during the year, like for the past couple of years. And I, I just I just love that. You know, the one of the the things they did last year with at the person's house, like you had to earn that. You know, you had to go and follow the rules and follow the ciphers and you had to earn it. And I I love the fact that that they're giving us something to do when there's nothing else going on to earn something, you know, oh, and I, and, I totally appreciate it as well. And, and we did. And, and the thing is too, it's like this, like I said, this isn't directed at you and it's, it's more directed at everybody else that complains and the, the strangers that get frustrated when I just don't give them the answer. But it's like, because this is something extra, it's free and you don't have to do it. You can easily just not do it, not get frustrated and, and still love alone. You know, and it's like, I, I just want to like give alone like props for that, for being able to do this and, and having things during the off season, whether it be clues or, or events or whatever. Like, I just love the fact that they're still doing it just because they love doing this. Oh, and I, I you know, it sounds like I might be contradicting myself, but I agree with everything you just said. It's like more power to them. I hope they continue doing it. It's just in this particular instance, I, it just didn't work for me. And On the other hand, look, you were ahead of me by a couple of days on this process. And you know that every time I got the next step, every time it started to make sense to you, I would very excitedly message you (laughs) like, oh my gosh, I got it finally. (laughs) Well, and it's funny you say that because when you're, you know, obviously Russell and I are, are really close. We do a ton of things together, but we don't really know how the other thinks when it comes to puzzles. <laughs> and, oh, wow. That is an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> and he, see, when Russell, you know, he wouldn't ask me for, for help, but he would say things like, this is what I'm doing. And I'm on the other side of the phone or, or the computer slapping my forehead, basically <laughs> saying, really? How, why the hell are you thinking like this? How are you even coming up with this? And it's just, it's just really funny to, to see how different we are to come to the same place. And, and, you know, our initial reactions to things are just so different and it's, it's funny. Yeah. I, I get a kick out of it as well. And it frustrates the hell out of me sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, uh, I think after this pass alone puzzle, we, we agreed we're never doing a, escape rooms again based on your way of thinking, right? <laughs> so, hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> well, I, I think the key thing is, uh, between Mike and myself, uh, I am a much more visual, uh, and this happens in escape rooms. You know, I, I, for some reason, clue into bigger, more visual things. And I'm always the one that, you know, figures out the overlays and figures out the connecting pictures that you have to figure out. Like that's, I'm a more visual guy. And I remember in being in an escape room with you at one point and looking at a puzzle and going, Hey Mike, get over here. This is your strong suit, not (laughs) mine. (laughs) Cause it was a very cipher oriented kind of solution that we were looking for. But yes, we do look at things very, very differently. But together, combined, we're like perfect or something. Wow, that almost <laughs> sounded like a feels moment. I would no, I was I was trying to I was gonna do the Captain Planet theme or something. <laughs> together with their powers combined, they form <laughs> Shazam. <laughs> oh. Uh, uh, so, but yes, I I I am looking forward to the next alone, even though this round of puzzles bummed me out completely, and I am frustrated and and i'm not as excited for alone as i would have been if i just hadn't had this experience but still looking forward to it 
moving on from Alone, uh, another one of our favorite haunts, Mike and I are both uh, survivors of Blackout, uh, regular season and off season. And they did a really experimental, I don't know, project event experiment called 21. We don't want to go into too much detail because actually it's still available to people. Uh, the best I can say is it's sort of an interactive text and phone experience, which is based in doubt, self-doubt, paranoia, uh, questioning your environment around you. And I think what you get out of 21 is how much you're willing to play along and put into it emotionally and psychologically. Yeah. And, and, and this is another thing where it's something that doesn't really need to be done. It's done during an off season. So it's something cool. You know, it's something from someone we love, like we love blackout. We've been through everything pretty much. And, you know, it's, it's another way we get to share in the blackout experience. Uh, this experience is, it's cool because people that have never experienced blackout will get to experience it. And they are probably having the same feelings that we had felt the first year of going. Like Russell was saying, the paranoia and, you know, you, there is a point like you, you will be scared if you never have been to a blackout before and you live, say like, you know, in Nebraska, you can actually participate in blackout. And I think that's awesome. And, you know, for those people, like they're doing, it, it's an awesome job because those people are, are really getting to experience the fear that, you know, that we felt inside the actual haunt. You know, I think that that's awesome just because Blackout is so limited in where they go. You know, they've only been in three cities or four cities at this point, and not everybody has the travel money to go check them out. So it's it cool. Is, it is a good introduction, I think, uh, especially for people who don't have easy access to the major cities where Blackout usually has their brick and mortar locations and, and does their usual haunts or off seasons. I know that Blackout is hinting that there are multiple chapters to this. So, which is something which is not really a spoiler. You you do get that. You can you can find that information online that there are chapters coming. So, I'm really curious as to see where this leads, particularly since uh you are asked in the process of Blackout to give up some personal information. And one of my, you know, minor quibbles with 21 is the fact that that really wasn't utilized. So it'll be interesting to see if it's utilized in the future in future chapters. Agreed. So yeah, so definitely looking forward to what's coming next for Blackout. Uh, if you do want to participate in 21, you can check them out on Facebook. And you can check them out at the web at theblackoutexperience.com forward slash 21. And speaking of experimental stuff, Mike and I participated in something new from Sinister Point recently. Yeah, over the holidays, they had the hunt for Krampus. They did the hunt a few years ago, I believe. It was a great success. The hunt for Krampus, uh, everyone met at Sinister Point. There are teams of four, and you were basically sent on a scavenger hunt to gain as many points as you possibly could, and then to track down Krampus and bring him back to Sinister Point. So beginning at the very beginning, when they give you the rules, there were certain things which they stated like this was not a race, except there was a time limit. So it sort of was a race. And I don't know how you feel, Mike, but overall, I felt this was a lovable mess, <laughs> I guess would be the way to put it, because That's... we had a great time. I like I absolutely... It was great hanging out with you and Deb and Jake, and, and they were four-man teams. We also had friends on other teams, but we kept stumbling along the way, partially because of the way Sinister Point had set things up. And this is not sour grapes or anything. This is literally just, we kept encountering things that didn't make sense and could have been run so efficiently. So even though we had a great time, we really, really did, I think the event could have been so much stronger. For example, uh, the race thing at the beginning, we literally, you, you had to do sort of a foot race with a character and we did it and it completely fell apart as it was happening because the two Sinister Point employees weren't playing the same game. So literally we got to the end of this little foot race thing that we had to do. And one person was claiming that we were supposed to be doing one thing 
And the other Sinister Point employee literally said, wait, you're not doing what I'm doing. You're doing something different. And we ended up losing the majority of the points for that race because those two employees didn't instruct us or tell us what we were supposed to be doing. And as the race was going on, they were doing totally opposite things. Right. And, you know, there was a, there was a few things. Um, one of our last puzzles when we went to the location and there was nobody there. And I think when you do things like this, you need to make sure everybody knows what's going on. So we get to this location and there's nobody there. We see remnants of what used to be there. We see glow sticks, we see ice, but there's no one there to tell us, oh, we're done with this one, so you need to go here. And I believe the instruction had been something about finding an elf character. Yeah. So we probably spent 20 minutes looking, wondering if, okay, is this character nearby? Are they hiding? And come to find out that for some reason that location had been abandoned and they didn't send out a text, they didn't send out any communication. So we literally wasted a bunch of time at a location that they had abandoned. And and that's what irked me a lot. In the notes that they gave us, the, the instructions, the last page said, if you want to know up-to-date info on Krampus, be at this location by this time. It didn't say that it was mandatory. It just said if. So, like, we really didn't have any plans to go there because it, said, it didn't say it was mandatory. It didn't say you have to be here. It just said, you know, if you want news. So I figured you go there and you find out, like, oh, was, was Krampus caught or, you know, things like that. But the, pe the reason that last location was abandoned is because all of those people went there and they went to set up for the next part of the hunt. I don't know. If, you, if something is mandatory, say it's mandatory. And it basically was because when we, what we ended up doing at the location, which had obviously been abandoned, we texted in finally after spending about 20 minutes searching for the character we were told to find. And the response was, oh, we'll go to that location. So we went to that location. And even there, you know, we weren't the last team to show up, but you, you kind of got redirected at that point. And we're told that you had the chance to go hunt Krampus, except I don't know how they determined who was given information first, but we were standing there. We were the very last team to be given the update and everyone else was in their cars driving away. And we finally got our information last. So basically it was a race and basically we had no chance because not everyone was at the same starting point. Right. And on top of that, we did not come in last place. So it's not like they gave us information because we were in last place because there were still maybe like four or five teams below us. Yeah. So, and they, they all left before us. So we're not really sure like how it happened, but you and know. And actually that was part of our frustration that night was we had no clue. And we were promised points for the location that we went to where the characters had abandoned it, but we, it was never clear to us whether those points were given or not. And as I said, it was sort of a lovable mess because we definitely enjoyed what we did, but that last hour was really frustrating because we kept running into these weird things. And if there had been more time, and this is what I meant by, they said at the beginning, this is not a race, but that's exactly what, is it, what it was, is it was a race. If they had given, if, if the whole event had been one hour longer, we probably would have been able to make it to at least one or two more locations. And talking to the team that did make every single location, multiple team members on that team told me flat out, the only way that we accomplished this was we absolutely drove like maniacs. <laughs> which is not what you want to be doing during the Christmas season in the middle of a busy city. In Orange County. Yeah, so it was like, like I said, like we had a great time because we were hanging out and we were doing fun stuff together, but the whole Hunt for Krampus event was a bit of a mess. Yeah, I mean, it like exactly what Russell said. I mean, if it was fun. Like I had a fun time hanging out with everyone. Uh, we were all in the car together and because everything was driving distance away. You know, it was fun. I did have a fun time, but at the same time, if this happened again, I probably wouldn't do it, you know, and that's, that's just me personally. You know, I, if it's, if it's the same exact setup and everything like that probably wouldn't, but you know, that's me. Uh, well, that's, well, the, that leads to a good question is, is like, does this affect your opinion of sinister point events in the future? Well, I mean, 
I've always had like this weird thing about sinister points, non haunts, like they're just, they're fun, but goofy. And it's not something that I'm really into personally. They, they do a good job at what they do at like, you know, like they do like movie screenings and, you know, they do other things, but they did like bingo last year and I'm sure it was, it was fun and I'm sure it was cool. It's just not something I'm into, you know, especially when the last taste of my mouth of their haunt was beyond the mirror from a couple of years ago. That was one of my favorites that year. You know, oh yeah, he, it was. Uh, we, I had a blast at that haunt. You know, and it's like I've I've been going to Sinister Point haunts since they were like in the parking lot of the Brea Mall. Kudos to them for for getting bigger and better year after year. But I miss the haunts, and I want that. And you know, it it, it doesn't affect my opinion of Sinister Point as a whole. It's just if they just keep going in this direction, I'm probably not going to be doing it. Oh, very interesting because I, I'm a fairly new recruit to Sinister Point only for the last couple of years. And I've enjoyed these events, non-haunt things, but I do see a consistency of a lack of polish uh, to some degree. Uh, the And unfortunately, what was it called? Fear? Yes. That was another situation where, you know, I walked out of that thinking it's too short and the character that I encountered was actually being detrimental to us succeeding in the task. And I talked to another team who said, oh, really? Because the character that we encountered was completely helpful to us and wanted us to succeed. So it was com two completely different you know, attitudes from the Sinister Point staff. One of them was trying to literally obstruct our success when I went in and did it. And then somebody else said, oh, no, no, no. The character was very helpful to us and helped us figure stuff out. So that that is part of my issue with the hunt for Krampus as well, is we did this, you know, one thing where literally the two employees are looking at each other going, wait, I thought you were doing this. I thought you were doing that. And we suffered points for it. So, you know, and I, and I was, I was frustrated there and I turned to one of them and said, this is extremely confusing and frustrating. And they basically said, well, sorry about that. Yeah. We're just doing our job. I'm still willing to stick with their off season, off haunt kind of things, but I do absolutely hear where you're coming from. Yeah. Cause we've had good times, but it's because we're with friends having good times. Exactly. Um, and interestingly enough, and this is going to be the best segue ever, but the winning team for Hunt for Krampus included Caden, who is the owner of the basement. And wouldn't you know it, the basement has a new room called The Study that Russell and I both did. And it's awesome. Yes, it's fantastic. We had such a good time doing this room. It is extremely interactive. It is, uh, it's, it's an escape room, which I don't want to give too much away because I, I think if you know Mike and I at all by now, you know that we hate spoilers. It is a room which encourages you to work individually to solve certain aspects of the puzzles. I absolutely love that aspect of it. And the fact that you are finding yourself having to break apart and work on things individually in different areas of the room at the same time and then come back together to put the clues together. I, I think it's a, a one of the best design rooms we've done so far, in my opinion. This is one of my favorite rooms ever. Like, there's so much going on. There's so much in this room. And this room is just so ambitious of of the basement and Caden and the, their design team. It's, it's incredible. And the biggest thing, and you know, I'm, I'm not related to, to Caden. I'm not like his dad, or I'm not even really, you know, we're friends on Facebook, but we're more of acquaintances, but I can't, I'm just so proud of him. And that seems weird to say, but from where the basement started to where it is now, you can tell how much they're learning and how, how they're upping each room. You know, you started with the basement, which was a basic escape room. They had, you know, they have clues hidden and, and stuff like that. And then you go into the... The boiler room. Then you go into the boiler room and that's... The ante is up in that. There's, you know, there's different kinds of puzzles that are just kind of more high tech. And then when you go into the the study, it's the same thing. That's even upped from, from the boiler room. You know, there's high tech puzzles. There's things that like just tricks and things that are going on in there and props that are just like, holy crap, you know, just in just a year and a half going from that to this, like that's such an accomplishment. And 
I like, I am happy to give you my money to go through this. Like, you, you know, and there's a reason like everybody goes to this and I can only imagine what the next room is going to be if they keep going in this direction. And it's, it's, it's incredible to me. Oh yeah. I, I think Mike and I both uh, are fans for life of the basement and anything they do. It's been so much fun exploring their stuff. Yeah. And, and I just want to give a big, huge shout out to Benjamin Marsh, who is always goes out of his way to show us a good time at the basement uh, in whatever room we're in. So Yes, we have encountered Benjamin uh, in a couple of different performances at the basement. So Ben, you're awesome. Don't ever change. We love you. Yeah, he knows how to uh, scare us in the dark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's everything that we've been up to. There's some new stuff coming up that you might be interested in. First one is a new show from what we learned here called Partuition. And just if you did the research, parturition uh, means the action of giving birth. All right. So that's going to be interesting for the male patrons going through his show. Um, <laughs> that might hurt. Ooh. Um, and they just released tickets. Uh, you can get tickets at whatwelearnedhere.com. And the dates for this show are January 28th through the 31st. And I believe on Thursday and Friday, they start at 8 p.m. And then they go, the last time slot is at 12.45 a.m. And then on Saturday and Sunday, the first show is at 6 p.m. And that goes until 12.45 a.m. Another thing that's coming up is uh, we were just talking about Sinister Point. They're doing another new show called Seance. And that is going to be February 19th and 20th and the 26th and 27th. And tickets are on sale now at SinisterPoint.com forward slash seance. And remember that the point in Sinister has an E. So it's P-O-I-N-T-E dot com. I know Russell's going to this. I'm, I'm bowing out based on everything I just said. But a friend of ours is involved, and I'm sure it's, it's going to be an awesome time. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm very curious as to what they're planning on doing. I am a magic fan and Mike is a magic fan as well. So I'm really curious to see if they're going to be incorporating some of the old spiritualism techniques uh, that were popular in America from the turn of the century, back when spiritualism was a much bigger business than it is now. Uh, so I'm really curious to see what Sinister Point has up their sleeve for this one. And then one of our most anticipated escape rooms is finally opening and we're so excited crossroads escape games in anaheim they finally got all their permits settled and tickets are on sale for that uh, we're going to be going in a few weeks so we'll let you know how that is but if you'd like to check them out go to crossroadsescapegames.com uh, there's another new room opening up in la called the alchemist room and that's part of escape room la escape room la they did the detective room that we've done uh, the cavern, and then also the theater. So we've done three out of the four, and we're going to do the fourth one. Um, it just opened up, and you can check them out at escaperoomla.com. Uh, one other thing that I'd like to mention, uh, it involves me personally. I'm going to the Sundance Film Festival. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, I'm sure you've gathered by now, Mike and I are both fans of the immersive theater piece and Haunt Blackout. Well, there has been a documentary made called The Blackout Experiments, and it has been selected to be shown at the Sundance Film Festival this year, which is uh, near the end of January. And I have been interviewed for this documentary, and I know that I'm in the documentary. So I'm going to Sundance, and I'm looking forward to seeing this with, a, with an audience to see what the reaction is. Uh, I don't want to say too much about the documentary Hopefully, you'll be able to see it sometime this year. As far as I know, it does not have a distributor yet, and usually Sundance is key in helping make that happen. But I'm really looking forward to seeing it. There are several of my friends are also interviewed in the documentary. Uh, those of us who discovered Blackout early on during the LA days uh, back in what? Was it 2012? Has it been that long? Yeah. Wow. Wow, I, I still to this day remember my very first opening moments with Blackout. Truly, truly one of the greatest haunt moments I've ever experienced. We'll save that for the Blackout episode. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, it, it really changed me creatively and, and, and really affected me deeply. And I get to speak a little bit about the effect Blackout has had on me and several of my friends get to have, have that opportunity as well in this documentary called The Blackout Experiments. We'll have more information that I'm sure coming up. 
it was directed by a man named Rich Fox, and I, I, I hope that this uh, helps explain to people who don't have the opportunity to do Blackout just how creepy and effective they can be with what they do. Another thing we should mention, absolute congratulations to J.T. Molner, who is one of the creative geniuses behind the Freakling Brothers, Vegas Haunts, the Freakling Brothers... Um, are personal favorites of ours. Uh, They are great, great haunts in the Las Vegas area each Halloween season. J.T. Mulner is a director. He has directed his first feature called Outlaws and Angels. It is, oddly enough, actually part of the same programming block of Sundance that the Blackout Experiments documentary is. It's the Midnight Screenings. Super, super proud of JT. Uh, I'm going to do my best to catch Outlaws and Angels at the Sundance Film Festival while I'm there. Uh, Congratulations to him. He is truly one of the greatest guys in the haunt industry, and we wish him all the best with him and his feature. So uh, that's about it for us this time, and thank you again for listening. If you get a chance, please give us a five-star review on iTunes. If you don't have iTunes, you can always listen to these podcasts on our site, myhauntlife.com slash podcasts. If you need to get a hold of us, email me at mike at myhauntlife.com or russell at myhauntlife.com. Remember, two S's, two L's, or else he'll send Krampus (laughs) after you. And with that being said, thanks again, and we'll see you next time. I'm Mike. And this is Russell. And thanks for listening. Starts with an A? I think so. Like Ambitious? Ambitious, that's it. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Total brain fart. <laughs> uh, okay, you done laughing? <laughs> <laughs>